Thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar on graduates in the early years workforce. My name is Eleanor Ireland. I'm, I am the programme head for the early years at the Nuffield Foundation. And we're very pleased to be launching the findings of two grants we funded today, both looking at the role of qualifications in the early years workforce. So a couple of points of housekeeping before we get going. Um, as an audience member, you can't be seen or heard, but we are very keen for you to ask questions. And you can do this by typing your question into the Q&A box, which you should be able to open up when you point your cursor to the bottom of the screen. If your question is directed to a particular speaker, please do say who it's for when you type it. We also have closed captions in English for this webinar, which you can turn on by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of the screen near the Q&A icon. Um, and finally, we will be recording the webinar today and we'll be sending the link to the recording round after the event. So please do feel free to share this with anyone who, you know, who isn't able to attend. So we've got two presentations today. The first is from Dr. Sara Bonetti from the Education Policy Institute. And the second is from Dr. Verity Campbell Barr from the University of Plymouth. Following the presentations, we're going to hear from our panel of speakers who will respond to the findings of the studies. And after our panel members have spoken, we're going to open up with questions to sessions and comments from the audience. And these questions can be addressed to any of our presenters or panel members. So please do free, feel free to post any questions or points of clarification or any comments in the Q&A box as the speakers are talking and we will answer them at the end. Now, before we get started, I wanted to say a little bit about why we at the Nuffield Foundation chose to fund these studies and why we think the findings from them are so important. Now, a review that we have recently published about how the lives of families with young children are changing, led by Kerry Oppenheim, painted the picture that's probably really familiar to all of us about how the majority of children under five spend a large amount of their time in early years education and care. And this is driven by the increase in the number of families where both parents are working. And we also know that the risk of poverty for families is highest where there are young children in the family. And there's clear evidence about the effects of growing up in poverty on children's outcomes. There's also very well established evidence about the potential for high quality early years education to improve children's outcomes and reduce the disadvantage gap. So early years education and childcare has a role to play in limiting the effects of poverty on children. And we know from EPI and other studies that qualifications of staff working in early years settings and their skills are key in providing high quality early years education. And it's generally accepted that graduates are important. But the evidence about their role in improving children's outcomes has to date been quite mixed. So this is why we wanted to fund the study that Sarah is going to be talking about today to try and give us a better understanding of the role of staff qualifications in improving children's outcomes. And when we're talking about the importance of degrees for early years staff, we can sometimes assume that a degree qualification is giving graduates a particular set of skills and knowledge. But we don't actually know a lot about what early years degrees are made up of in terms of their content and how they prepare graduates to be able to deliver high quality early years education. So that's why we felt it's important to fund the study that Verity is talking about today so we can better understand what we mean when we talk about an early years degree. So these two studies are by themselves both very important but together they really help give us an insight into the role of graduates in the early years and their role in improving quality in early years education. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Sara Bonetti from the Education Policy Institute to talk us through the findings from her grants. Over to you, Sara. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, thank you for the introduction. I will go straight into my presentation in the interest of time. And as, uh, um, as Eleanor mentioned, this is, uh, um, this is the fourth strand of a two-year uh, research program which aim at improving our understanding of the early years workforce and the link between workforce characteristics and children outcome. Uh, so just to give you a bit uh, of an over, uh, a background, our starting point was a paper published in 2017 by Joe Blandon and colleague which looked at the impact of workforce qualification and offset ratings on children's outcomes. Uh, using data for uh, on children in preschool between 2008 and 2010. Uh, by the time we started this study, we had eight additional years of data. Uh, and so in total, 11 years of data on children in preschool between 2007, 8 and 2017, 18. And so we looked at into updating the analysis with the extra years, but also we had access to a wider pool of qualifications, namely the QTS, EYPS, but also the e early years teacher status, and also on qualifications below graduate level. 
And finally, we were able to, for four cohorts of children, we were able to look at the association, not just with earlier foundation stage profile scores, but also all the way up to Kissage uh, 2. So just briefly on the methodology, I'm happy to answer questions later. Uh, we use nation, national data and uh, national pupil database linked to the earlier census for children, again, in preschool for uh, in, in those 11 years, which gave us more than 6 million children in our sample. Um, the earlier census allows us to have information on children who attend private, voluntary and independent settings, which are at the center of our analysis. Uh, and uh, the earlier census also gave us different type of, uh, of data, both at the establishment level and at child level. Then linking the earlier census data with the uh, spring census, we gained more information on children and their family background, which allowed us to control for additional elements that we know are important for children outcomes, such as uh, whether a child is later eligible to, to claim preschool meals, uh, is, if the child is the pupil is uh, speaks English as an additional language, etc. Um, so jumping straight into um, our regression models, uh, our outcome measures were the standardized scores within each cohort of uh, um, at age uh, five, the earlier Spanish stage profile, uh, age, age seven, key stage one, and age 11, key stage two when available. We focus only for the analysis on three and four year old children who took up universal entitlement in PVI settings, because that is where we see the most variation in qualification levels. So while we did descriptive analysis on children attending any setting, the focus of the analysis is on children who attended PBI settings. Um, we used five different models, uh, each one building upon the other. Uh, so the basic model, we only control for the cohort with ear dummies and we add primary school fixed effects, which take care of some of the issues related to the earlier expansion stage profile as a measure. Then we added control for child characteristics, such as again, gender, month of birth, eligibility for free school meals, etc. Then we added control for setting characteristics to look at the characteristics of other children in the settings. And then the further control on other setting inputs, such as, such as ratios, for example. Uh, but I'm going to present um, mainly the results from our preferred model, which is number four, although in the report, in the appendix, we present results for all five models. But you can see that you, in the report, you can see that moving from one model to the next and increasing the number of controls allows us to zoom in into a more precise assessment of the association between workforce qualifications and children's outcomes. We also split the analysis into three strands. Uh, for reason I, I will explain in a moment, but just to go straight into the first batch of key findings, which relate to children who were in three and four year old between 2007 and eight and 2015 and 16, um, we found a general uh, positive but small association between qualification measures as defined in several ways um, and earlier foundation stage profile scores. Uh, we split the analysis into two time periods to account for the change in the earlier foundation stage profile in the academic year 2012-13. Um, but we find similar results between the two profiles anyway. Um, just to put it in simple terms, the effect size of having a graduate at the setting is 0.3 of an early years foundation stage profile score with a new profile. We also found that there isn't much difference in the fat size between having a graduate at the setting or a graduate present in the classroom. And finally also that there is a, the positive association is driven by um, staff who have a qualified teacher status rather than the EYPS and early years professional status. We also look at uh, results by child characteristics uh, we found no stronger associations between graduate ladder qualifications and outcomes for subgroups compared to the sample. You can see the first column is the whole sample of children and then we disaggregate it uh, by different subgroups. And again, the, uh, the results are mainly driven by uh, staff with the QTS rather than the EYPS. And we found that the effect for children eligible for free school meal and English as additional language um, are either slightly negative or not statistically significant, but we will see differences later. Um, so 
we then run a separate analysis for the years 2015-16 and 2017-18 because there were some changes in the variables that um, had an impact on the variables that we use, both in terms of like proportion of graduates out of the total staff in the setting, but also ratios. Although there was no data on qualification for 2016 and 17. But the key point is also that for those years, like for 2000, since 2015, 16, we had also data on early years teacher status. And for the last year available to us, we also had information on level two and level three uh, staff at the setting. So in general, we found similar results. We found small but positive associations, although we do find that um, when looking at the EYTS, the, the effect size is quite similar to the effect size of a QTS, but again, still higher than, than the one for the EYPS. We also found some more results that are positive and statistically significant compared to the previous year's analysis, so the 2008-16 analysis. Uh, particularly, we found that a positive association for all qualification levels, also in the case of uh, uh, pupils who are English as additional, who have English as additional uh, language. Um, again, the associations are small. They're about 4 .4, 4, 0 0.45 of a EYFSP score uh, for, uh, QT, uh, for um, um, QTS. Um, so it's, it, it's, not, it's not very big. Uh, but importantly, again, for the last year of data, we had um, information about level two and level three staff. So we really wanted to um, have a sense of the, the average staffing structure at the setting. Again, these are averages. We know that there is a lot of variations. But we found that on the average total staff at the setting is about 13.6 staff members. And we could account for about 85% of total staff. And you can see how, the, on average, the different level of qualifications present at the setting. However, we do miss information about 15% of the staff, which means that we need to be really cautious in interpreting the results of this part of the analysis. But in general, when including level two and level three staff in the analysis, the presence of a graduate shows no significant association with children outcomes while an increase in the proportion of level two and level three staff has a negative association with EYFSP score. So again, at face value, it appears that the positive association with graduates is driven by the fact that setting with more graduates have fewer level two, level three, but we cannot be completely sure about this because we are missing 15% information on 15% of, uh, of the staff at the, at the setting. However, when we then also look at um, um, uh, when we accounted for the interaction between the proportion of graduates and the proportion of level three staff, we found that having a graduate uh, present leads to the level three staff uh, to be more effective if the level three staff is in the classroom. We did not find the same for level three in management role, but this is something that I think should make us uh, reflect. And finally, while this was not the goal of the study, by the time we started, we had the first year of, uh, of the first cohort of children who had access to the 30 hour policy had uh, completed the EYFSP stage. So we wanted to probe around and look at whether there was a difference between children enrolled at an earlier setting for more or less than 15 hours of the free entitlement. And we found that attendance beyond the 15 hours the universal entitlement doubles the effect size associated with the presence of a graduate in terms of EYFSP scores. So we need to be careful in interpreting these results because we know there's a lot of selection bias in children attending settings. Um, and this could be driven by the link between longer hours and coming from a wealthier background. So we checked uh, hours of attendance for free school meal children. And while we've seen in the general analysis there is doesn't appear to be any association between the presence of a graduate in the classroom and EYFSP scores for free school meal children, this relationship becomes positive when the child attends for more than 15 hours. And I, I will come back to this uh, later if there are any questions. But the last bit of the analysis is on um, the longer term perspective, the longer term association with key stage one and key stage two. And we found a small but positive association between degree level qualifications and key stage two outcomes. Again, 
associations are very small, but the positive sign and the persistence of this effect are important. And they defeat a little bit the narrative of the fade out effect of investments in the early years. So just to summarize, in, to summarize the finding, uh, we found a small but positive association between the presence of a degree qualified staff and children outcomes as measured by the early years foundation stage profile scores. Associations are consistently larger for QTS than EYTS, but also the EYTS uh, has, a, has a significant uh, uh, association. Uh, the positive association is sustained over time through key stage one and key stage two. And the positive association between, there is a positive association between attending earlier setting with a graduate for more than 15 hours and scores for children who later on claim preschool meals. So given this study, our key recommendation is the first one. We do uh, recommend pilot studies to investigate the impact of different formulations of staffing composition within a setting. We've seen it's really important to understand the composition in terms of level two, level three graduates and other qualifications for which we did not have data uh, through the National Pupil Database. However, this study is also set within the context, as I mentioned, of a longer term uh, work program. So putting it in the context of also other studies and particularly also the one Verity will talk about later, we also think that um, the government should review early years degree to assess the difference between the different uh, degree level qualification and particularly in the induction system. And then we, we suggest an assessment of the cost and benefits of extending the 30 hour entitlement to be universal, not just to blindly like um, extend the 30 hour, but to do first a cost and benefit analysis to make sure that also it doesn't affect quality and access uh, um, moving forward. Um, so before uh, handing over to the next presenter, I, I wanted to give just a little bit of final context. Uh, again, it is not by accident that this is the fourth strand of a wider program. So we think it's really important to contextualize this funding with other studies that have shown that the earlier sector is very fragmented and has shown the difficulties that PVI settings face in recruiting and retaining highly qualified staff, in struggling with financial strain. And the other important bit to remember is uh, that, again, early education is really important, but we cannot expect to uh, be a silver bullet for everything, above all in the context of high poverty rates. So these, I, I, and I think COVID has shown this more than ever. So this links into the small effect sizes where, that we found. Yes, they're small, um, but should we expect more? Uh, it is really important to put this study in the context of uh, children's outcome being a function of their experiences more broadly, not just in earlier setting, but particularly at home. And also like what type of attendance we see because part-time or erratic attendance cannot, expect, cannot be expected to offset uh, you know, the, the, the problems caused by poverty, for example. At the same time, we cannot expect a small proportion, in this case, like an, an average of one staff per setting with the degree to create systemic change. It is very unrealistic to expect a qualification level of one staff member in a, in a sector that is really uh, generally low paid uh, and have very little opportunities for CPD to really create systemic change. And then again, linked to the following presentation, there is a clear variability among early years degree. So what does it mean to have a degree in early years? How can we expect a strong effect size if we don't know what's behind an early years degree? And I think that will lead into um, Verity's next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, it's really interesting to see those small but consistent associations um, between the presence of graduates in earlier settings and children's outcomes, but also really useful to remember the context um, of which uh, young children experience um, their early education. Um, so we're going to go straight over to our second presentation um, from Dr. Verity Campbell-Barr from the University of Plymouth from the grant that she led looking at early years degrees. So Verity, over to you. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, so thank you, Alan, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for that um, presentation. Um, as Sarah's indicated, um, the project that she and I undertook um, has looked at the specifics of early years degrees, seeking to understand what a degree looks like, but also the employment trajectories of those people who complete these different degrees. So as we've just been hearing, degree qualified staff do contribute to the quality of early years provision, and this has positive impacts on children's outcomes. The evidence that Sarah's presented actually builds on the international literature that we have that signals the importance of degree qualified staff. But when we look internationally, what we can start to see is that there are huge variations in how degrees are structured, both in relation to their subject content and practical arrangements. But then when we look at England alone, we can also see that we also have variability in the degrees that are on offer. Some of these have been responses to policy changes, others of which are down to how higher education and further education institutions opt to deliver their courses. So for example, within those Bachelor of Arts um, degrees that we've got there, we know that there are a range of different course titles available. So the project that we were undertaking was seeking to review the online course descriptions of the full range of degrees available within the English context, but also to look at the employment trajectories of those graduates. Um, and what I'll do is present each stage in turn. So the first stage was led by myself and Catherine Gulliver at the University of Plymouth. And what we did was that we began with going onto the UCAS database and searching for degrees that would enable somebody to go on and work in early years services using key terms such as early years, early childhood studies and so forth. We then followed UCAS suggestions to check for additional courses um, and it's worth noting that we undertook our search during the summer of 2019 and we did see variations in the number of courses available on a day-to-day -day basis as institutions were obviously adding or removing courses. Once we had our initial search we also went to university web pages and we again started to notice that there were some other courses available or others that had ceased to run. But our initial searches identified 647 different courses that a person choosing to want to study early years degrees in some way could undertake. As we started to look at more detail, we did notice that there was a degree of duplication or that some courses weren't um, suitable. So the non-suitable ones were perhaps more orientated towards a health profession. Um, and the duplication reflects things like where a university might have a foundation degree, a top up and a full three year degree being available. So in the end, we were left with 320 different degrees in which we could analyse their online course descriptors. Um, and we, used, we did the analysis via a framework approach, which enabled us to organise the data and explore both structural and interpretive features of the degrees that were on offer. In terms of those structural features, you can see that we looked at key information around um, the university, the titles and so forth. Um, pertinent here is the entry points, which I'll come on to in a moment, but also the age range. And by this, we mean the age of the children that the degree said people could go on and work with. And as we'll see in a moment, this was pertinent to our findings. We also looked at interpretive features. So these were um, drawn from the existing literature around the kinds of subjects that people might study within a particular degree. And we piloted these on a selection of degrees before refining our final list. So coming on to the um, structural features, what we noticed is that actually the options available to somebody choosing to look for an early years degree is that they have a highly fragmented choice available to them. So whilst the majority of the degrees that we identified were BAs, we did see variation in those titles and in terms of what was actually being studied as part of those degrees. We also noted that the UCAS points were highly variable in terms of entry, and you can see the range and average there, but also that there were variabilities in terms of what additional requirements somebody might be asked to have before starting the degree. Of the 281 that gave us details about whether or not the degree included a practical element, we found that there was no consistency in what was being requested of students. So, for example, sometimes there, there would be a stated number of hours to be completed per week, per term. In other instances, it was just recommended that they might like to undertake a work placement. 
Further, given that the literature has raised the importance of age-specific child development knowledge for those going on and working in early years services, we noted that there was a huge variation in terms of the age range that was being stated alongside degrees. So whilst many of them said it would cover working with children from birth to eight, we also saw ranges of birth to 25 years of age. So this graph here represents the frequency of the interpretive features that we've uh, put up earlier. What we note is that there's no obvious disciplinary core, which represents the theoretical hybridity of early years degrees. However, what we do note is that there's a very strong employment focus to the courses with a clear emphasis on professional practice. Also, whilst this graph represents the content of degrees as being fragmented, a mapping exercise that can be seen in the full report does demonstrate that there's a huge amount of connection between these different subject areas. We also recognise that while the online course descriptors don't provide the full detail of a course, we have to note that references to statutory requirements around working with children, such as safeguarding and children's rights, did not feature as prominently as we had anticipated. Um, the second part of the project was led by Sarah and Felix at the Education Policy Institute, and I'm thankful to them for helping with putting these slides together. Um, their data was drawing from HISA in terms of people who completed their degrees in 2012-13 and destination data for 2016-17. Uh, so we do acknowledge that there is a slight time lag between their data and the analysis just presented. However, the data that they have enables us to look at both the course and student characteristics, employment trajectories, and also the geographical movement of students. So what we notice in terms of the early years student population is that actually they are quite unique. They're significantly older than other graduates. A large proportion have non-traditional educational backgrounds. They're more likely to study part-times and there's a higher proportion um, studying foundation degrees. So we think a success of early years degrees has been their ability to support widening participation agendas. So in terms of the employment trajectories of these students, what we note is that 56% of the students go on to work in the early years sector. And we can surmise that of the 15% who are identified as managers and proprietors, it's likely that they are also working in the early years. However, the data affirms what many of us already know in terms of the financial rewards of working in early years, that there's little incentive to undertake a degree. However, the incentive is slightly improved if you choose to study teacher training or if you manage to achieve a higher premium. However, we would also note that the degree isn't just about getting the um, pay rewards, it's about improving the status of the sector. Interestingly, what we noted in terms of um, the student population is that in terms of their geographical movement, we can see that it's very limited. So, for example, the distance travelled from home to university tends to be less than 50 kilometres and likewise the distance between home and work and then university and work. So what we're concerned about is whether or not this localisation of the early years workforce has potential consequences for where we're going to find graduates across the country. So our key findings are that early years degree choices are highly fragmented. The content and age specialisation and work placement arrangements and the links between theory and practice are also fragmented. And as we've seen, whilst the student population, um, there has been something to say that they're different to the wider population, which supports wider participation um, agendas. Um, we do wonder whether or not this might have an impact on their employment opportunities. The majority of the graduates do find employment in the sector, but as we know, the salary premium for accessing an early years degree is limited, unless pursuing a teacher training course, for example. But also what's interesting is what might be the consequences of this highly localised workforce. So our recommendations are for a review of the content and structure of degrees, including how they fulfil the legislative arrangements and requirements that graduates will have to fulfil in their future professional roles. We also think there should be a review of what work placements should look like, but particularly in terms of how students are supported both within those placements and to understand their local contexts. There needs to be a better understanding of the induction models for those working in the sector. 
And there needs to be an easy access overview of courses that, in terms of how they meet the QAA benchmarks that can help inform students to pick the degree that's going to be right for them. Thank you very much, Verity. Um, it's really interesting to see that fragmentation of early years degrees, and I think it helps give us a bit of an understanding of the findings from SARA's project about the size of the effect of having a graduate in early years settings on children's outcomes. Um, Verity, can I just ask you a point of clarification, please, um, which actually uh, came up more um, in um, Sarah's uh, presentation, but I, I know you'll be able to talk to it, which was that I was wondering if you could just very quickly explain the abbreviations of QTS, EYTS and EYPS, just to members of the audience who aren't familiar um, with those abbreviations. Thank you. Yes. And uh, apologies, because I know acronyms can be very frustrating for people. So uh, QTS qualified teacher status, EYPS early years professional status, and which one have I forgotten? Early years teacher status, EYTS. Thank you. And the EYPS no longer ex exists, is that right? No, uh, so that's been uh, replaced with the early years uh, teacher status. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Great, so we're gonna move on to um, our panel now. Um, and before we do, I just wanted to remind you that you can post any questions you have in the Q&A box that you can access by clicking on the Q&A icon in the bottom middle of your screen. Um, so our first speaker today, who's going to be responding to some of the findings presented by Sarah and Verity is Dr. Nathan Archer. He has worked as an early childhood educator for over 20 years and as an early childhood and primary teacher. And he's worked both in the maintained sector and the private and voluntary sector, so he has a real breadth of experience. He recently completed his PhD looking at the professional identities of early childhood educators, and he's currently working at the Nuffield Foundation as a researcher on our Changing Face of Early Childhood in Britain series, which published its first report a couple of weeks ago. So Nathan, over to you. Great stuff. Thanks, Eleanor. And thanks very much for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion this afternoon. Um, I'd like to just offer some reflections as someone who, until relatively recently, as, as you were saying, has worked in practice and as someone who continues to work in a range of capacities with schools and settings and local authorities. So it's with that experience that I, that I come to the conversation. Um, I followed both Verity and Sarah's work over a number of years with real interest. And I think these reports offer important additional contributions to the debate on the early childhood workforce um, and that's a topic on which I think we need to continue to, to shine a spotlight. I think it's also important to note that these reports have been produced in a specific place and time. Um, the, they're situated in a landscape where we have uh, witnessed uh, quite sustained attention and uh, investment over a number of years on workforce development but that's been followed by a period of um, policy neglect. In fact I, I go as far as to say there's now a policy silence around uh, workforce reform. So turning to, to Verity's report, I think this considers in detail what constitutes early years degree qualifications. And uh, she's just been talking about the trajectories of, of graduates in the early years sector. And I think this makes compelling reading. And um, in particular, I was struck by um, how early years degree choices and the content of those qualifications and the workplace arrangements are all highly fragmented. And the point about the early years uh, workforce being high, highly localized uh, certainly reflects my experience as well. But there's one, one uh, finding in particular that I wanted to focus on, and that's that the majority of early years graduates find employment in the sector, but there's no real financial incentive for them to stay. Um, and that echoes work by the Social Mobility Commission um, earlier, earlier in the year, and also what many of us know anecdotally as well. Um, I've seen adverts for early years teachers uh, with a starting salary of £18,000 a year or thereabouts, but with no sector-wide pay scale for increments. And they sit alongside recruitment ads for colleagues with qualified teacher status on a starting salary of around £25,000 a year as part of a national pay scale. So indeed, there would seem to be little financial incentive for some of those graduates uh, to stay within the sector. And whilst I accept that salary isn't always the main motivation for many early years professionals, I think it raises important questions about status and about parity. Uh, and it perhaps goes some way to also explaining why there were just 350 ind individuals who joined the Early Years Teacher Programme in 2019. So turning to um, the report that was led by Sara, um, there are important uh, contributions there to ongoing discussions about how quality is conceptualised and the impact of Early Years qualifications on children's outcomes. But in particular, I wanted to just hone in on a couple of those findings. 
Um, first of all, that there's a positive association between the presence of degree qualified staff and children's outcomes as measured by the profile. And secondly, um, the authors identify the differences across the types of degree level qualifications. So the association um, is, is consistently larger for those who have qualified teacher status than for those with EYT or EYP. Um, for me, those findings speak to the debate about status and professional standing across those qualifications. So taken together, we know that there's a positive impact uh, of graduates working in early childhood education on the one hand, but there's no financial incentive for them to stay in the sector. Um, so why is this? Well, the Education Select Committee in 2019 echoed the Nut Brown Review on recommending a QTS route for early years. But this was rejected by government on the grounds that the PVI sector is not governed by school teachers' pay and conditions. And that's true. But there are precedents for dealing with this, both in England and internationally. So many people um, on the webinar today will remember the Graduate Leader Fund, um, which included a quality premium. And that was offered to top up salaries for those early years professionals that, that were working in settings. And in New Zealand, supply side funding for salaries is paid directly to, to early childhood settings through funding agreements that are linked to qualifications. So there are solutions to this. But it would seem to me that there's a reluctance on the part of government to consider this route. And that's down to a lack of political will to invest what's needed. And for me, that feeds into broader questions about children's rights and entitlements, regardless of where they access their early education. So we also know that funds for qualifications, which were once available through local authorities, can't be found in settings own budgets. I know personally nurseries who are struggling to meet their obligations on mandatory training, let alone professional development and qualifications. So for me, um, as a model, financially, this no longer stacks up. All of this is set within an era both pre-COVID and exacerbated since COVID, when balancing the books for many settings, be they maintained private or voluntary, takes extraordinary tenacity from leaders. And I know um, this from personal experience as well. So just to wind up, um, for me, this is what American academic Mark Nagasawa calls an old fight. This is a fight for attention and status and resources for the sector. And we need to continue to draw attention to the challenges that the workforce face, not just in this COVID era, but more broadly about the impact of not having graduates in our early childhood settings. So what these two reports do, I think, is equip us further to make the case for sustained investment for children for the long term. And I look forward to following the, the work of these researchers and also the Nuffield Foundation on this subject. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, yeah, was it really interesting that you touched on the graduate leader funds, because I know um, that was um, one of the uh, policies that um, Sarah looked at in a report from earlier on um, in her grant that we funded, which she might like to mention later. Um, and of course, really um, interesting um, and uh, relevant to mention COVID as well, um, and the effects that it's having on um, particularly the PVI sector in terms of their finances. So we're going to um, go straight over to our second panel member today, um, who is Becky Cook, who is a head teacher of Harewood Nursery School in Pontefract in West Yorkshire. As well as running a nursery school, Becky's the chair of trustees for the Water sorry, Waterton Academy Trust Preschool Organisation and chair of trustees for early education. And she's previously worked as a local authority advisor for SEND in the early years. Now, Becky, I want to say a particularly big thank you to you for making time to join us, as I know the two weeks before Christmas are always a really, really busy time in nurseries. And I can't even imagine what this last term has been like um, for you with having to deal with COVID restrictions. So thank you very much and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, um, the opportunity to join you this morning to add uh, my thoughts to this. I'm just going to attempt to um, do the share screen. Okay, can you see that? We can, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so, as has been mentioned, we already know that um, well-trained, knowledgeable and intuitive practitioners do deliver the high quality early years education across the sector. And we expect our graduates and our practitioners to have a really good understanding of child development, regardless of what that course is, um, come from, whether it be a graduate course or a level three qualification, 
Um, we expect our practitioners to be able to observe children at play, to recognise learning that's taking place in order to support them. We expect that practitioners have a really good understanding of the importance of play and that they have a good understanding um, and a playful approach with children themselves and to know when to join in at the right time and how to join in with children. We also expect all our practitioners to have the ability to create a calm and nurturing environment, both the physical environment and with the adults in the setting. We expect practitioners to create invitations to play, opportunities to try new things and to provide time and space for children to explore independently. We expect practitioners to build strong connections with children and their families, to give professional love to children, providing security and strong connections so that children feel part of the nursery family. We know that practitioners do come with various qualifications and I expect to find a range of knowledge and experience in any team. However, I expect our graduates to be reflective, to demonstrate emotional intelligence, to be resilient, to have high expectations of what children can do and can achieve, and to have a wealth of knowledge to draw upon to be able to develop into exceptional early years practitioners. This is a lot to ask of our practitioners. Decisions are being made a pace in settings minute by minute when working with children. Practitioners have to be highly responsive and adaptable when facilitating young children's learning. Good early years practitioners are professionals. They are experts at knowing what young children need and when. They forge relationships with children based on trust and on enjoyment of each other's company and enabling children to thrive. And I think it's important that we recognise our practitioners as such. So each student that we work with here at Harewood um, and any new practitioner who enjoys the team, we acknowledge will have had a different experience prior to joining us. This is dependent on the ethos of the settings that they visited or worked at before and the courses they have accessed and also the level of support that they've, re that they've received throughout that time. So with this in mind, in school, we have two student mentors in school and they work closely with the local colleges and they support each student throughout their placement with us. We work with students who are on work experience from high schools, students who are working towards level two or level three in childcare and have two, we've had two apprentices over the last four years, both of whom I'm pleased to say are now employed within school. We also work with initial teacher training students from our two local universities. We also ensure that no matter what starting point when a practitioner joins the team, as we know that these routes are varied, that we have a period of induction either with one of the mentors or another member of staff to enable the practitioner to spend time observing children, talking about the learning that's taking place, also an opportunity to have a really good rummage in the cupboard so they know exactly what's available and to hand when they're working with children. And practitioners spend time just being with the children, observing the children, getting to know the children and observing how other, others interact with the children in the setting. And that's before we then get on to all of the safeguarding and the, um, the health and safety elements, the first aid training, all the, um, the things that they have to have in place as, as part of working within this team. So just as we want our young children to settle in and feel welcome and part of the family so that they feel secure enough to join in and have a go and be the best that they can be, we also want this for our student visitors and, and all our practitioners. Toddlers or trainees, we're all learners on the same path. We decide to work with children. That's the bit where we're beginning to find out about it. We're exploring, seeing if it's for us. Then we're studying for the qualification, whichever one of the plethora of qualifications are available to our staff. We're learning about it, we're interested, we're practicing, we're growing in confidence. However, when we find employment in the sector, that's when we become fully immersed and now we're really learning about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, 
I thought, yeah, that you, one of the issues you raised was about the importance of play. And it's um, really interesting that you raised that because I know that came through um, in Verity's um, reports and she certainly looked at that. So I was, maybe that's something we can touch on later um, in the Q&A session. And it's really also so interesting to hear about the um, sort of range of different routes by which um, practitioners that you work with um, come into your setting. So thank you. Um, we're going to go straight to our third speaker, Max Stanford, who's the Head of Early Education and Care at the Early Intervention Foundation. Max has extensive experience in research in early years policy, having worked at DfE for many years, directing various high profile studies, including SEED and the evaluation of the 30 hours offer. And he's also worked at the Office of the Children's Commissioner and was the evaluation lead for Blackpool Better Start. So Max, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great introduction. That was a good <laughs> biopsis of my bio there. Um, so yeah, many thanks for having me on the panel today. Um, I just wanted to say, first off, a huge congratulations to the authors, to Sarah and Verity and the others on that for two fantastic reports. I think they really helped build the evidence base here and just for Nuffield for kind of funding the work as well. Um, so yeah, I only have five minutes. So I'm going to kind of kick off. I want to make four points, one on methods and three on findings. Um, the first one is kind of on methods, really. I think it's really encouraging to see that the use of kind of large scale administrative data sets for both reports. Um, I know that Sarah's report has kind of caveats in its analysis. But I think it's really important to kind of try and make full use of these uh, data sets, especially longitudinally. I, I like the fact that, you know, using the earlier census right through to key stage two in some instances is quite positive, um, especially because we know from the work that we do with practitioners and, and providers that they often feel quite overburdened with data collection. So I think really showing the utility of this is, is, is really important to get their buy-in. Um, I know there is kind of limitations to the data, um, especially the EYFSP, um, the things about the, the kind of the teacher assessment and it being at the end of reception, um, and also with changes to the EYFSP next year, uh, makes long shoot, will make longitude analysis quite harder uh, and kind of less robust. Um, and I know there's the reception baseline assessment, um, but that centers on kind of language and communication and, and math. And I think the one methodological point I wanted to make is that I think we do need kind of an easier to use kind of holistic longitudinal assessment of preschool uh, child's progress uh, that can be really used across preschool settings. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the use of quite a holistic uh, assessment, which includes uh, social, emotional and physical development in the International Early Learning Study, which recently published the report, and recent trials for the Early Years Toolbox are quite good in terms of pushing that forward. Um, so I just think it's quite critical that, that we think about that and, and try and kind of push the evidence based on that, especially because I think we do really need to help um, have a common uh, outcomes framework, uh, especially, you know, kind of coupled with better kind of data collection. Um, so the, the, the points I wanted to make on kind of the um, findings, mainly on um, the one about, like, you know, the fact that there was a larger effect on language and communication. I think this is quite interesting. Uh, we know from our own EAF uh, work that language is a kind of key driver of early child development. We also know that poverty is a really la large risk factor for language delays. And I'm kind of left thinking, like, what degrees the what do degrees give practitioners the, the skills needed to help children develop, especially their kind of language and math skills? I think it's interesting that, that Sarah's report kind of highlights the larger effects of QPS. Uh, and this also speaks to Verity's finding, uh, which highlights the kind of the diverse range of non-QTS uh, and kind of questions whether they have enough age-specific child development focus. Um, I think it's, it's quite positive that the um, Department for Education's professional development um, program centers at CPD on kind of level two and level three and has a language uh, and communication focus on disadvantaged areas. But I think I'm left kind of wondering from the research uh, what this means for kind of social emotional development, self regulatory even physical uh, outcomes, particularly as we've seen in, in, in ever emerging evidence in, in COVID of the impact that these are having. Um, second uh, point uh, I think is really interesting is kind of the positive finding on the EYFS scores for kind of attending settings for longer uh, with a graduate, um, particularly the finding that EYFSB children uh, impact on graduates only uh, became positive only when they're attending more than 15 hours. Um, of course, there's an implication for 30 hours. But for me, I think it was quite important to, to see what the this has and what implications this has for, for disadvantaged children, children of the two-year-old offer. And I think there's maybe some more research that could be done there, which I think would be really really useful. I appreciate, you know, methodological issues and, and lots of children being in the maintained sector when they take up to to your disadvantage offer. Um, but it also kind of just highlights another, a big, even bigger question around the support that the preschool children get. Um, 
and I think it's it's quite important to kind of say that you know it's it's we need to think about what the qualifications level are for people like childminders, but also kind of other childhood services. I know this week's announcement on the, the family hubs and kind of ongoing support that lots of children still do have with children's centres. I know uh, like often it's not not spoken about, but lots of children still do attend centres. And I think understanding the the kind of the, the staff qualifications uh, of them and the impact it's having on preschool um, children is really important. Um, my final uh, kind of comment really uh, was about the similar effect sizes for graduates being employed uh, at settings as, as well as just working with them directly. Um, I think that it's interesting to highlight as well, you know, the, set, the impact that a small uh, piece of the data found around the positive impact of a graduate on level three workers having an impact on children. Um, and while again, caveats aside and the need for kind of better data on all staff, um, I think it's uh, really important to kind of highlight that, you know, level three uh, and, and kind of th those um, people in the settings, you know, make up a really large majority. Um, and while graduates can't kind of individually make up, you know, determine the quality of an earlier setting, I think that they can indirectly with working through other um, people in the setting really, really help upskill. And I think peer-to-peer -peer CPD mentoring is, is quite an important aspect of this, um, especially using to kind of upskill uh, the, the larger workforce. Um, and I think this is quite pertinent uh, given, we you know, that the impact of COVID where the need for CPD will be highlighted, but also the resources will be start substantially less, um, you know, given the tight uh, financial situation that they, they have. Um, so I think the professional development fund, you know, using mentors is, is quite a good aspect, but I do actually think that the role here for local authorities to help coordinate support CPD and quality improvements in settings, as Nathan highlighted, is really important, particularly given the large variation in degree, you know, regionally and, and locally. Um, but I think it's quite difficult, um, given that uh, the funding uh, for 30 hours bypasses uh, local authorities quite a lot, and they obviously have a huge substantial uh, full. So I think I'm just going to end here just by quickly saying that um, I think it's really positive reports. Um, but I think that it, as, as the report kind of highlights that, um, you know, a large investment from, from places like the Graduate Leadership Fund is, is something we need to think about. You know, staff qualifications are very important as well as CPD. Um, and I hope that kind of using quite a, a kind of long term kind of evidence based policy on improving uh, quality for both you know, graduate level and CPD is, is important. And I think these findings are really good to help. DfE and kind of the government think about the three year spending funding and, and what they might want to highlight and then kind of put in them to Treasury. So, um, yeah, going to end there, but welcome question. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I thought your points about CPD were great and really interesting and they've actually come up quite a lot in our questions um, from the audience members. So we're going to come back to um, those in a minute. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of other speakers who have something to say about CPD as well. Um, but we're going to go on to our final panel member now, and we're honoured to be joined by Professor Cathy Nutt-Brown from the University of Sheffield, who of course led the Nutt-Brown Review, which has been mentioned more than once already today, um, and who's received numerous awards over the years for her achievements in her work in the early years. So Cathy, over to you. Turn the mic on. Thank you. Um, um, thank you to the Nuffield Foundation for inviting me here this morning and congratulations on two really scholarly and timely reports. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today but forgive me if I say I wish I wasn't because the issues that you're focusing on should have been long sorted. Um, but first of all I'm really conscious that these two reports um, come as the last two, I think, of four important reports about the workforce this year. The Social Mobility Commission and Pascal and colleagues have written um, about the crisis that the workforce is suffering and put forward yet again um, recommendations. But this problem is not new. Um, the Rumbold Committee, 30 years ago, in a couple of weeks time, reported concerns on the status of the workforce. Uh, just this year Baroness Yardley, a former Secretary of State for Education, pointed out that you have to have a PhD to teach a university student but some don't even have a level three to teach young children. But these two reports add important fuel to the call for urgent policy shift. Now I know that two, uh, 2020 has been like no other for our government or governments around the world, 
but this is a problem that could have seen action decades, let alone years ago. And I conclude simply that there is a lack of political will. As a, as a sector, we've been told that change will be expensive and that, there will, that it will therefore take time. Yet, as we have seen, it is possible for successive governments faced with difficulties to find sufficient funding with urgency. Immediate crises like the pandemic that we're living through bring that into sharp reality. And no one would disagree with the need to urgently fund what's happening at the moment. But my point is that money cannot be the reason for lack of action. The crisis of qualifications in the workforce is a slow burn crisis in terms of what happens in, and consequences for our children. But it's a crisis nonetheless, and somehow money must be found, and that takes political will. There's a crisis of recruitment and retention, as we've heard. Many earlier staff around the world have the same experience. And the recruitment and retention crisis in this country will persist until the stresses, the long hours, the poor pay and lack of career structure, particularly in the PVI sector, are dealt with and the lack of qualifications which enable educators to develop deep understanding of children's learning and their development are what's needed. So recruitment to the workforce and subsequent retention of those staff continues, as we've heard this morning, to be a problem, as does the achievement of a representative balance of gender and BME staff in the workforce. Good career advice, good support for initial qualifications, suitable pay and conditions are essential to addressing the emerging crisis in the workforce. And there's no doubt that there's a problem to be solved here. One way of affecting change is to develop an attractive and accessible way for people to enter the workforce. Some may enter as unqualified apprentices and progress by taking further qualifications along the way. Abbott and Pugh in 1996 put forward the notion of a qualifications ladder and I suggested something similar. And one might be forgiven for feeling a little like the, the reporter at the start of the film Groundhog Day. We've been here, we've said these things many, many times, but unlike the reporter in Groundhog Day, nothing changes. High quality early education and care relies on well-educated educators. Qualifications are important because they provide a marker of what educators have learned alongside good supported practical experiences and mentoring. A well-educated, well-qualified workforce is essential to high quality provision for young children and towards uh, closing the attainment gap. So early childhood education and care faces urgent urgency in providing consistency in quality in young children's education because too few have good level degrees with the depth of knowledge and skills and understanding that such qualifications attest to. Qualifications are not simply a piece of paper or a hoop to jump through to obtain a particular job role. Qualifications should stand as evidence of what early childhood educators know and can do, and in particular, how they can think for themselves about how to support young children's learning in the everyday through highly attuned practice and thoughtful reflection. I want to say congratulations to Nuffield and to Sarah and Verity for keeping the issues alive and it's time that our government did something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, I've got a couple of comments um, now, which I'm just going to read out, which um, are very relevant to what you were just saying. Um, so I'm going to read those out before we go on to um, our questions, which have come from the audience. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, so we're going to try and get through as many as we, of them as we can in the, in the remaining 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. OK, so the first comment that I was just going to read out um, is from Valeria. Uh, Scott, she and apologies for mispronouncing your name there um, and she says it's just a general observation 
but salary must be one of the features to stay in the profession. We must move away from a conceptualization of the early as educator who is in the job just to love children. We need to survive too. And we can't be perpetuating the stereotype of an educator who's a martyr with a mis mission to save children, but without needs themselves. Um, okay, so, and there was another comment um, that I just was going to mention from um, Sarah Cobb, who was saying, I'm wondering about the conceptions of having graduates in a setting, because it seems more the case that we are encouraging graduates to go to a setting. What about more emphasis on the people who are already working in a nursery to become graduates? Many of the practitioners I've worked with have years of experience, but may feel unable to take up a degree, notwithstanding the funding and the time issues, etc. perceiving a distance between nursery life, research and university. And um, Verity, I was wondering whether you wanted to respond to that comment, given um, the work um, that was done as part of your grant, looking at um, what you know about early years graduates and sort of their backgrounds and, and where they've come from. Yeah, I mean, I think it is worth emphasising that the data did show that actually early years has done well in terms of the widening participation agenda. I think it's also worth acknowledging that that data does come from the period when there were different funding streams available to help with that widening participation. Um, but I think pulling together some of the different strands that people have been talking about on the panel and looking at the comments, it is, it's actually about a holistic approach to supporting the workforce in terms of their professional development. So yes, there will be some undergraduates who will um, you know, be typical in terms of age 18, looking at UCAS, 20 university, but it is also about how um, universities and colleges collaborate with settings as well so that there's support for those already within the sector. Um, and that actually, you know, we, we need to have this model that there's a is pulling together these different strands so that we look holistically at the ways in which we approach professional development for all of the people working with um, young children in, the, in this country. Great, thank you very much, um, Verity. Um, so we're just going to go on to a question um, from um, Stacey Mann now. Um, and she asked, do you feel that CPD opportunities need to be increased? and that the sector may benefit from having a specific number of hours that need to be completed as it used to be. Um, and I'm going to put um, that question to um, our two um, practitioners um, on our panel. So um, to uh, Nathan and Becky, um, who would who would like to start? Uh, sure. Nate, can, Becky, can thank you. On that. Yeah. Um, I think it's vital that we continue CPD throughout our careers at all levels. I'm, I'm really fortunate in that in, a, in our nursery school, we do have five inset days a year as part of the school calendar. Um, and, I, and I include all of my staff in those inset days. And yes, it, it's a little bit expensive because it means I have to pay the staff to be in on those days, but it absolutely pays dividends and they're worth it. They're worth investing in and they're worth us tying it into our development plan within the setting, within the school to move our practice forward. And the last year for us, um, because we've had obviously periods of, of closure and not all staff have been in at the same time, we've been on rota, we've really had an opportunity to um, upskill across a lot of different areas and explore um, training opportunities in this last year. And so that has been a little bit of a, a positive spin for us, but it's something that we would always invest in and always allocate part of our budget to as, as absolutely best we can in terms of the, you know, the the restraints on our budget, but it, it is a priority for us. Thank you, Becky. Um, interesting to hear a slight um, sort of silver lining in COVID there. Um, yeah, Nathan, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess there's just a couple of points on that. I, I'd go back to the point I made about the financial model, and unless we see some sort of quite significant changes in the way that the entitlements are funded and, and models that settings are running on, I think it's probably um, not necessarily productive to come up with a set number of CPD days. And I guess the other thing I would say is that I'm not necessarily a fan of a kind of minimum number of, of in terms of quantity of CPD days. And really it's about the, the sort of quality of, of, of that professional development. I think um, in recent years, professional development's been quite centrally driven. And I think it's been um, quite piecemeal in its sort of initiative basis. So I think it needs to be much more responsive and, and context specific. Great, thank you very much, Nathan. Um, so we are going to move on to a question um, from um, Erica Boak now. Um, 
This is a question to Sara, um, and Eric is asking if you considered graduates retention or tenure, and were you able to adjust the EY uh, earlier foundation stage profile scores accordingly, and could potentially low retention help explain the comparatively small effect sizes? Um, these are, I mean, all interesting points. Unfortunately, the data does not allow us to see for how long um, a graduate has been employed in a particular setting. So not, not with the data we had available, but it is definitely something that should be explored with other data. Thank you. And then um, on a similar sort of point of clarification, um, Laura Barber is asking whether you controlled for children who had, had attended a setting from um, two, either as part of the two-year-old entitlement or funded privately? No, this time we, it, we can say, I, I can say it, it was in our bucket list to uh, look at two-year-olds, but we did not control for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got some um, questions coming in about um, the um, EYPS, the e, um, EYT and the uh, QTS. Um, so I just want to touch on some of those now. Um, so, um, Sarah, did you um, look at any of the differences or, or could you say something about some of the differences between them that might account for the differences in associations with child outcomes? Um, and I was also wondering if maybe Cathy wanted to comment on this point um, slightly. And um, uh, this is a question from Sandra Mavis. She's also asking about the implications of this for workforce development. So we'll go first to Sarah and then to Cathy. Yeah. So. Um... There are some clear differences, particularly there were some clear differences between the QTS and the EYPS. Um, one of the reasons why I think we see um, a higher, although still small, but higher effect size in the case of the EYTS is because um, in the process of the EYPS being replaced by the EYTS, um, the, um, the qualification was really, uh, was really changed. It was made more in line with what is uh, uh, taught um, to students uh, enrolling in the QTS. So it's more aligned in terms of focusing on, uh, on, on teaching, on language and math, for example. There is, uh, um, you know, there, there, is, uh, there, are, there are clear structural differences. The entry requirements are the same as the QTS, although there are still differences uh, in terms of, for example, induction system, as, as uh, Verity was mentioning earlier, which is why we, we still cannot fully compare QTS to EYTS. Also, I think there's the one clear difference that was mentioned also by, by Verity before is that the QTS still has an age focus, it, which is three to seven, while the EYTS has a zero to five focus. I think there are some significant, some, something to keep in mind when looking at how, how trainees are trained uh, through the different routes. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and Cathy, did you want to respond on that question as well? Um, thank you. So in answering, I would say uh, we need to bear in mind that the import, an early and a well-educated workforce uh, is important so that we have a proud and capable uh, workforce who are able to provide consistent high quality across whatever setting and provision they're in. Having said that, I'm wondering as I'm listening to Sarah, um, it strikes me that there's something around being a lone graduate in a setting, and I think you touched on that as well. Um, if you have um, several graduates together in a, in a larger setting, there's more likelihood, I would speculate, um, that they might be able to make much more of a difference. We can see that they make some, um, but I think it's very hard to be the lone graduate and also the idea that you get your you get your qualification and you immediately go and lead practice. That's, that's a hard ask. Um, there's no justification for EYTS. All teachers should have the same qualified teacher status and why we differentiate between those who teach the under fives and the over fives. I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you, Cathy. Um, we've got um, a question from Beatrice Merrick um, now, which is asking, what do the panel think should be the sector's reaction to yesterday's announcement of government funding for level three qualifications under the lifetime, under the lifetime skills guarantee? Could this be a step towards upskilling the early years workforce? So I'm going to go back to Cathy on that and then I'm going to come to Max to ask you to comment as well, please. 
I think it is a step um, and it's exactly that, a step. Um, somebody on the panel, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, talked about um, giving people the chance to level up. And I think we, we ought to be doing that and that funding might possibly be used to level up. So um, if people want to enhance their qualifications and become graduates, um, then yes, we need to make sure that we've got funding at all levels so that people can progress through and work through a, a career structure that's worthy of the name with ex access to funding as they wish to progress um, through. And I echo also Nathan's point about what we pay people. So we need to treat early childhood educators well so that they can do the very best job in terms of all the things that Becky was talking about providing for every single child in our settings. Thank you very much, Cathy. And Max, did you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, no, just really quickly, I agree with what, what Cathy was saying. I think it's interesting to see what this has in relationship to the professional development programme and, and how that links in with, with the CPD work that they're doing um, that they'll be launching in, in January. So I think I think it's important. I think, like I said, it's a step. It's maybe quite a small step, but as you can see from the, the graduate leadership funds, you know, it's big investment that seems to be the thing that will drive up. So, so it just needs to be like maybe bigger. And I think just coordination and kind of having that offer together, you know, bringing these two initiatives together might actually help um, explain to the explain to professionals like what's out there. Thanks, Max. Um, we're very nearly getting to the end, so I'm just going to um, take um, one, make one, read out one more comment, um, and just ask all of our um, panelists that we've got lots of unanswered questions. So please do go ahead and feel free to um, answer them in the Q and A function now, um, if you can. Um, the comment was um, just from Charlie Ann Kirby, which says, "I think often the lone graduate is um, often the manager, and quite often they are sat in the office rather than being with children and other staff. And surely this won't be effective." towards children's learning and development. Um, as we're very nearly out of time, um, I am going to ask all of our speakers and panel members just to um, give us one quick, um, an answer to one quick question from me. Um, and we, just to say, we did ask um, the Department for Education to join our panel today, but unfortunately no one was available, but I know that they are here in the audience today. So whilst we have them listening, I'm going to ask you all to very briefly say in less than one minute, what you think the key thing is that the DfE could be doing to improve quality in early years education. I'm just going to go through the order in which you've spoken. So I'll go first to Sarah, then Verity, Nathan, Becky, Max and Cathy. Thank you. Yep, so I thank you, Eleanor. Um, great question. Uh, while the topic today has been workforce qualification, I think many policies changes will not realise their full potential until the government sets out to review their funding system. And by this, I don't mean just the funding rate. I mean how the system is structured to allow parents to have much simpler access, to have providers to be delinked by this certain amount of money per hour per child and just have a more stable funding stream so that they can plan rather than having to be reactive. Thank you, Sarah. And Verity? Um, yes, thank you. I mean, I think we've heard already that about how we've seen reviews of qualifications for the early years sector um, at other levels um, in recent years. Um, and I think there's a real need to ensure that we have a review of level six um, so that we can um, emphasise um, you know, what it is that a level six should be looking at. But this really must be done in terms of looking at models of mentoring, both for pre-service, so whilst people are training and once they enter the sector, because we're seeing the differences between the different qualifications. And that this needs to be embedded in a holistic model of professional development across the whole sector. Thank you, Verity and Nathan. Thanks. Yeah, it probably won't come as any surprise to, to hear that I'm calling for a, an increase in, in funding, sustained levels of funding as part of systemic change that, that Sarah talked about. And also, I think a comprehensive workforce strategy is long overdue. And that's something that both educators and children should be entitled to. Thank you very much. And Becky? I think it's really important that all training is quality assured and that qualification levels for early as practitioners are offered equal access um, across the country nationally um, and recognising and promoting qualified practitioners as professionals in their fields and uh, with an opportunity of a, a pay structure that reflects that. 
Thank you. And uh, Max? I was just going to say, um, kind of building on Nathan's really, I, th I think funding is really important, but also that it's evidence-based. Like a big thing is, you know, what, you know, is it effective? Is is the the work that they're doing on the fresh dirt and London and other things like that, are they kind of being effective? And I think if they evaluate them and put a lot of investment into that, that can help show what, what is actually improving outcomes. And finally, Cathy. Thank you. What we've been talking about today is a matter of children's rights. So I want to say to government, you have a mountain of advice. Please heed it and fund the action necessary. We can't afford any more delay. Children can't wait. Thank you. Um, and on that very clear message um, from Cathy, um, I'm afraid I've run us over time. So it's just um, remains to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers and panellists. And thank you very much to everyone who has joined us today to be part of the audience and has asked questions. Um, <clears throat> I hope you found the session useful. There are some really very clear recommendations to the government coming out of the findings. And there's also clear areas where we need to do more research. Um, as we mentioned, the session has been recorded and the recording will be up on our website along with slightly longer versions of the presentations that were given today for some more detail and the full reports. So please do feel free to access these and share them with anyone who wasn't able to attend. Thank you very much everyone.